What does it mean to be unashamed? I don't know about you, but growing up, I think any child here, any parent can tell you this. We've done some things that perhaps maybe uh, we're pretty shameful. Maybe perhaps, you know, you've fallen asleep in class. I know throughout Bible college, working three jobs, there are certain times and some people there who kind of poking some fun at you. I'll never forget the first time freshman year, and I saw one of the, uh, the upperclassmen. You could tell, man, he's had a, a rough night, just came off of work, and at a 7.30 class that, in that morning, I think uh, um, that morning, it was, it's, it's really difficult. I, I, I believe it was, uh, um, so I was my freshman class, is my, my sophomore, my junior class, and another upperclassman there, we were taking Greek for first hour. How many folks understand, you're coming off of work at 6.45 in the morning, you got a 7.30 class, and Greek is not going to help you wake up in the morning. Right? I mean, to, to this day, it's all still Greek to me. Uh, but friends, I'm so grateful. I mean, it's helped me understand, understand the Word of God a, a whole lot better and understand its words and its meanings. But friends, I remember that day, man, this, this, um, this gentleman sitting next to me, it looked like somebody had hemorrhaged all over his, uh, his notebook paper. We're taking notes. I'm thinking, that does not look like Greek. And somebody in the middle of the class decided to just kind of nudge him, hey, Brother Hawk wants you to open a word of prayer. Mind you, we're in the middle of a lecture. And Brother Hawk is giving his lecture in the middle of that. This man says, oh, all right, let's bow our heads and pray. Friends, I pray that <laughs> he starts going on and Brother Hawk just kind of stops like, well, amen. Glad you can join us now. You haven't been raptured. The notice of the rest of us are here. You're going to have a seat. We'll have a pop quiz at the end of the class. And I'm like, oh, man, this is, this is great. Don't worry, friends. Can I tell you this? Uh, as shameful that may be, there is no pop quiz after this message. But how many of you folks here have been, I've come to realize that in this day and age, there are several things that people proclaim to be ashamed of. I remember um, so winning and passing out uh, flyers for our, our kids' harvest. And somebody told me, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for doing this. Passing out gospel tracts? And as I saw on their window, I'm like, and I saw on their car and big old um, sticker on their window, it says BLM and there's little bill rainbows on there. Love is love. And it's all the different religious insignias on there. I thought to myself, oh man, okay, we're in for a treat now. And they told me, man, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And they start ranting and going off how they felt themselves being Caucasian, felt the guilt of their ancestors' past crimes and injustices. They told them about their social status and how those who eat meat ought to be ashamed of themselves. But friends, can I tell you this? I'm grateful to say, however, I'm not ashamed to be called an American. I'm not ashamed to be called a child of God, a Christian. I'm not ashamed to tell these people who have questioned themselves and their gender identity that I am a husband to my wife, a father to my children. I am the man of my home. I've never questioned that. I'm grateful to say that I identify as an independent, fundamental Baptist, a member of the Heritage Baptist Church. This morning, friends, I tell you, there's some things that I'm just frankly unashamed to proclaim. But I wonder in our lives, when it comes to us in a workplace, or maybe in that line at Costco or at the gas station, we have those tracks in the cars and we're across from us and we're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just here, just kind of do my thing. That, does that unashamedness stand fast even then? You know, the theme of unashamed is, a, is, a, is our, um, our YF theme for 2022. And I wanted to challenge our teens to not allow the world and its council culture to overpower them with their ideas and voices. I wanted them to realize that it was not only okay to come back to church, but that it was also the right thing to do according to God's word. And what they did not have to um, be ashamed of is doing the right thing because it honors God. Oh, friends, it may seem easier to remain silent when our faith is challenged, criticized, or even blamed by those around us, whether it be at work or at school or social media or even among our own families. We tend to forget, don't we? Or at least disregard the fact that our faith directly forms the Im and impacts our values. As a recent guest preacher, Pastor Dean Herring, put it, the object of our faith validates our living. We reason that we simply want to remain neutral and not cause any conflict at work, school, or our homes. But to remain silent, dear friends, brethren, beloved, is to surrender the future of Christianity to secularism, humanism, and an anti-God values. We're experiencing this in today's cancer culture. The polarizing 
idea that there are good people and evil people, those who stand for social justice, gender equality, and other woke ideologies are, are good, while we, those that oppose them, are evil. And therefore must be silenced or even abused, whether virtually or even physically, by doxing their information on, on the internet. But we know from Scripture that mankind was made in the image of God. Amen? Created to fulfill His will in our lives. However, since the fall of man, all of mankind, as we sung just a moment ago in our, uh, our hymns, they have, has been cursed by sin, and its effects is seen by man's depravity, his selfishness, his destructive behaviors, and a shunning of all things godly. But praise God that he's always had a remnant of people who, like the three Hebrew boys of the Old Testament, they refused to succumb to the world's threats. And as Pastor Fong puts it, they would rather burn than bow. As we've read in this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 1, we can praise God for the faithful few, like the Apostle Paul, whose lives have been changed, friends, transformed, if you will, because of Jesus Christ, and have realized their God-given purpose and direction because of the gospel. These people who rise and declare, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, I praise God so much for that young lady, as Pastor shared, who gave out tracts to her classmates. And despite the teacher being brazenly against it and putting her on the spot, God would somehow turn that around. Friends, you might be wondering how someone like Paul, who was completely... And this, um, before he became known as the Apostle Paul, against, he was against Christians before his salvation. How was it that he, become, he would become such a tremendous advocate and preacher of the gospel? How was it that this for, like a former businessman like Pastor Alan Fong, with no formal Bible college training or degree, could become the senior pastor of Heritage Baptist Church, an exemplary church in the Bay Area? Well, this morning I want to share with you three key aspects indicative of many Christ great Christians throughout the ages that we must consider, friends, if we're going to stand unashamedly for the gospel. This morning with me, would you consider me, first of all, I see it starts off with principled convictions. Principled convictions. Verse 15, he says, so as much as in me is, I am ready. How was it that Paul, the Apostle Paul was able to say that he was ready to preach the gospel? Where did Paul's zeal and passion originate? Well, first of all, friends, you must understand this with me. It commences at salvation. Before we knew him as the Apostle Paul, he was feared as the infamous Saul of Tarsus. Go back with me in Acts chapter number 9, if you would. You see his conversion in Acts chapter number 9, in verses 1 and 2, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to, to the synagogues, that if he, may, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You see, friends, at this point in time, Saul was already a very passionate individual. Unfortunately, this passion was manifested by an attack on the disciples of Jesus, and all that, he, all that he did, his teachings. By the way, can I tell you this, friends? The devil doesn't mind you being passionate. He just doesn't want you being passionate about the things of God. Hey, he wants you to pursue your hobbies. He wants you to pursue your sports. He wants you to pursue your ideologies. He wants you to pursue whatever it is that pleases you. So long as it gets you out of his word. So long as it gets you out of his house. So long as it gets you out of fellowship with him and his people. See, Paul's zeal did not discriminate against men or women. He sincerely believed that he was carrying out the will of Jehovah. Praise God, the story doesn't end there, amen? Notice on verse 3 and 8. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why per persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Jump down to verse 17. It says, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me 
that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. You know, it's amazing, friends, from this passage. We see Paul's experience was both physical and spiritual. Here he was, he was a tormentor, a persecutor of the church, of those that are following after Jesus Christ. And now Ananias, by the way, how many folks would have to like to be that guy? God told him, hey, I want you to go. And you know exactly who this person was. He goes in and calls him brother Saul. Friends, it's amazing here at the point of salvation, the transformation process that takes place. Paul understood the, tra the truth of a transformed life like no one else when he wrote 2 Corinthians 5.17 where it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Do you get that, friends? It's not simply turning over a new leaf. That's complete transformation. It's the same word for which we get the word metamorphosis. Old things are passed away, the Bible says. Behold, all things are become new. Paul knew that the life, his life in Christ gave him proper perspective and a renewed purpose. One that would propagate that which his old life tried to, ex to eradicate. See, Paul's principal convictions stem from his relationship with his Savior, Jesus Christ. And dear friends, this morning, fellow believers, can I tell you the same is true of you and I? Do you realize that you and I have the Holy Spirit of God willing, uh, indwelling us? And all he desires of us is that we would give him free access so that he might fill us. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it tells us, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you grateful for that, friends? In this world where that seems to be succumbing to all that is evil and wrong, we need, we desperately need peace. We don't need more pills. We don't need more drugs. We don't need better candidates or politicians. What we need is God, the peace of God in our lives. And he says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And verse 6 tells us, for when, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, but God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, do you, do you realize all that has transpired for you and I to have the atonement for our sins? Do you realize what God the Father had given, how Jesus Christ sacrificed? Verse 9 tells us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Aren't you grateful for that, friends? Life does not only truly begin um, until we have been reconciled to God through the atonement of Jesus Christ and our faith in his finished work. In the past, we've, we enjoyed forgiveness of sin. Right now, we now enjoy fellowship with God. In the future, that which is yet prospective, we shall enjoy forever with God. That's a promise from Scripture, friends. Oh, friends, we see this morning, it commences salvation. But notice letter B this morning. It is developed through study. As important and miraculous new birth is, it is God's desire as our Heavenly Father and as any good parent desires that we do not remain infants in our spiritual lives, but that we grow. You see, friends, growth is always a sign of good health. A daily consistent diet in the Word of God is essential to good spiritual health. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere, sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. He goes on and saying, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. As Pastor Herring said it in one of his sermons, our knowledge and the object of our faith determines the volume of our faith. Let me ask you this morning, fellow Christians, how great is your faith this morning? How great is your faith? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 15, study. Study to show thyself, first of all, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, friends, this morning, it's, it's important for us to study God's word, not only because God expects it of us, 
But because we need to know why we believe, what we believe, if we're going to direct others with the word of God. I appreciate so very much the fellow sponsors I, I get to serve alongside. And alongside, I remember this uh, earlier this year, where we were going through um, some so many discipleship steps and really just, not just educating, but helping our teens come alongside and understand w- what it is that we believe about their assurance of salvation. What it is that we believe about um, living a consecrated life, a life of purity. To let them know they don't have to succumb to the University of YouTube. Or the secondary of, of Google. The answers are found right here, friends. Parents, can I tell you, we want to partner with you in our youth ministry. That's our, that's our objective. That's our mission. We're not here to uh, reform society, to re- replace your child with somebody else. <laughs> as much as we want that sometimes. Friends, it is important for us that we ourselves know what God's word says. The Bible tells us there, if, here in 1 Peter 3.15, we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks, asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Man, it was, it was uh, such a tremendous blessing to talk to so many parents yesterday. And of course, you know, we kind of had, uh, uh, we brought the big guns by way of four chickens and a small little bunny called Snowy. I mean, come on, who can resist a small little lion face, a big old cotton ball like that? And as kids were being distracted, my wife did her job. I, I, I engaged, gave out some tracks and flyers and was able to talk to some people. And as I talked, I was talking to one parent there. She says, you know what, here at Heritage Baptist Church, our youth ministry, we teach them to identify truth and apply it to their lives. And this, this mother is like, wow, wow. Truth? According to whom? And I told him, well, ma'am, according to the word of God. And she's like, you know what? I'm, that's what I've been looking for. So I, I, I was going to a church prior to the pandemic, but the moment COVID occurred, our church shut its doors and has never reopened. And it's sad, friends. It's sad how that happens. And I told him, well, ma'am, you know what? Tomorrow, <laughs> I can tell you 8.30 at 10 a.m., you come to a place right here at Heritage Baptist Church, our doors are open. And we'll gladly extend a, the right hand of fellowship to you. And you will hear the truth of God's word. Oh, friends, our, see, this matter and then our lives, if we're going to have some convictions, principal convictions, it starts with salvation. It's developed through study. But notice that thirdly, let us see, it is strengthened through struggles. It's been said that a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. In our youth Sunday school, we're currently studying through the life of Joseph. Here was a young man who knew intimately of, of the trying of one's faith. And his life is an example that demonstrates true faith in the providence of God. He was hated as of, of his older brothers who tried to kill him, but ended up selling him into slavery. He ended up in a foreign land that spoke a foreign language, had foreign customs, clothing, and religion. He ended up in... And this land, this foreign land of Egypt, not only as a stranger, but friends, as a slave. That meant he had no rights and no privileges. Yet the key aspect to this entire narrative is found in Genesis 39, verse number 2. I love that phrase. It says this, and the Lord was with Joseph. And that's what it is. Friends, can I tell you this? Today, do you realize we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us? And no no matter what trial you might be going through, I'm grateful as pastor. We saw that baptism a few minutes ago. Miss Adela McDonald, the man, her husband, going through a, a very painful time in his life before he went home to be with the Lord. I'm grateful our pastor, being called by a fellow pastor in a different state, said, hey, could you send somebody to give the gospel to, to somebody out here? I'm grateful our pastor responded. I'm grateful that we were able to come alongside this dear lady to not only give her the gospel, to comfort her. You see, throughout the life of Joseph, how his faith was constantly tested and has responded in faith that the Lord would test his faith on a global scale eventually. Friends, the testing of our faith is a spiritual exercise. It starts with small acts of obedience. Reading your Bible, praying, getting baptized, church attendance, soul winning, etc. With each act of obedience, our spiritual muscles are exercised and strengthened. God will then provide us with more faith and more grace for the next day. 
James, I like the way he puts it here in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. He tells us this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Oh, friends, can I tell you, our faith is strengthened through struggles. God uses us. Why is that? Because in the stretching of our faith. In 20, June 2012, I was making my way out to uh, Joan and Ryan Slagle's wedding. There I made it on, turned off from the 880 to the 238. Just making my way. And just before I got to the, uh, the 580 West overpass, I'm in the fast lane. There's, mind you, this is in the afternoon. There's uh, traffic already building up. And if somebody's coming alongside, and um, I remember I get, I, I get cut off, and I slam on my brakes, they take off, and as I, just as I take my foot off the brake, I feel a big old thud, my head whiplashes forward, I smash my nose against the steering wheel, and as I look back, smoke is pouring out, and I notice my trunk has now become one with my back seat. And my eyes are blurry, my eyes, they're filled with tears, and it just reminded me of the first time we were getting punched in the face. You know? <laughs> my face is so numb. My eyes all watered up. And uh, some figure comes to me and says, Sir, sir, are you okay? My first thing was, how's, how's the person behind me? <laughs> and he says, what are you talking about? She hit you. And I, I remember alongside and he says, do you want me to call 911 or an ambulance? I'm like, no, I just... I says, my car, I looked outside, and he says, sir, he says, uh, you, you're kind of bleeding all over yourself. Unbeknownst to me, I, I didn't realize I'd broken my nose and hyperextended my left knee. I bruised a couple of my, my ribs, and uh, I, I, I slipped my, a disc in my back. I had no idea. This is all after the fact. I thought, if I just go home, take a couple towels, and I'll be good. <laughs> no, it was not. All that moaning and groaning at the time, my wife says, hey, he says, I think you should go to the doctor. Got an x-ray and told later. Needless to say, nine months later of physical therapy, seeing a chiropractor, um, man, I tell you what, it's still a painful experience. But friends, through it all, I remember being that first person to show up. And I remember at that point in time, and I'm in my mid-20s, and I'm showing up to my physical therapy class filled with a bunch of octogenarians. And then, it's so cute, they come along and say, Sonny, are, are you lost? And it's like, no, I'm, I'm here for my, my PT. <laughs> they start chuckling at themselves. Nothing will humble you more than to be scoffed at about a bunch of 80-year-olds. <laughs> right? who got little free weights and stuff like that, and I'm just simply trying to stand up straight, stand before the whole, this whole thing and trying to move my leg and turn a certain way for a period of time. I mean, I, I could not raise my arm because it hurt so bad. But I remember that the first, the first thing I did, and my, I saw my doctor, and she's like, ooh, um, sir, I think you, you broke a nose. And I looked in the mirror, I thought to myself, Some, something's a little out of place. And I, I, as I, this is before the, the age of video calls and whatnot. And I called and talked to my dad. I'm like, Daddy, I'm feeling a little pain. I got in a car accident. So I said, you're right. Right? You, you bleed internally? I'm like, I don't think so. It's about, my, my nose hurts pretty bad. And I think I may have broken it. He's like, ah, you're, you're just Filipino. It's already flat. You know? <laughs> I'm thinking, thanks a lot, Dad. That's why you never call your dad for consolation, right? <laughs> my mom's like, and my mom, of course, like, no, you need, to go, you need to go to the emergency room, son. And uh, I'm grateful that doctor came alongside. She put her hand, she said, all right, I'm going to count to three, okay? I just need you to breathe. My, you might feel a little, little uh, pain here. I'm like, okay, you can count to three, right? You can count to three. She starts putting her hand against my face. She's like, yeah, it's ready. One, boom. She did not count to three. And... Uh, and I was wondering, I, mean, I should have picked up on the matter when she had two other people holding my arms next to me. But friends, can I tell you this? Through that struggle, um, I thought to myself, am I ever going to um, come back to normal? We're ever going to have all these things. Mind you, um, 
at this point in time, my wife just had our son, Bo. And I'm thinking, man, I'm seeing all these people in wheelchairs about my age due to a car accident. And when they told me all that's lined up, and when they explained it all to me, they told me, sir, you're going to put the work in. You got to put the work in. But in, at the end of the day, is if, if you're a religious person, pray to your God. Because he's the only one who's going to make you better. And friends, I'm grateful it didn't come down to that where they had to be only relegated to, or if you're a religious person. I'm grateful that when that occurred, I wasn't the only one praying. Neither was my wife. There was a whole bunch of you folks. But through that, I understood as I was getting physically better, God used that situation once again to humble me. And through that, God saw some spiritual growth in my own personal life. Friends, our faith is strengthened through struggle. But for, for, fourthly this morning, I want you to see it's demonstrated through service. Jesus Christ at the Last Supper is the greatest demonstration of spiritual leadership. This later, earlier this year in the month of July, I took a group of guys down to Lancaster and there we, we went to a leadership camp. And Brother Jim Shetler in this leadership training workshop, he talked about what it meant to be a dirty towel Christian. And he took us to this passage in John 13, where it says in verse number 12, So after he had washed their feet and had taken their garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. You see, friends, if we're going to continue into... In the demonstration of our faith, it's going to be demonstrated through service. He goes on to say in Matthew 20, verse 26 to 28, But it shall, not, it shall not be so among you, but whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Oh friends, the purpose for HBC Care's ministry is for, is for service. It is for service. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for the opportunities that we have. Our HBC Cares outreach like we recently had at the Dublin Police Department. We would not have established some of the relationships that we had. We would not be able to see such a great turnout and response for some of our firefighters and some of our police officers and even paramedics were it not for something so small such as bringing breakfast to some of these men and women, having a word of prayer, our pastor giving a challenge to them according to God's word. Friends, can I tell you this? God's word still changes lives. And God still uses people of faith. The question is, will we stand up and say, God, here am I, send me. People are more likely to receive the gospel, not merely from condescending sermons, but from a life of sacrificial service to others. You know, bless my heart is here, as Pastor Dean Herring stated, man, even there in, 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 um, in Idaho, Coming alongside and helping people with flat tires. I tell you what, uh, there's some times, I mean, I've helped people on the side of the road at some times. Um, but there's just also sometimes common sense to uh, tell you no. <laughs> I experienced that first time I was, uh, had my first, I, when I first came up here, going to um, a youth worker's house in Oakland. And I learned real quickly, people are not as friendly up here as they are down in San Diego. You never stop over. On 98th Avenue in Oakland in the middle of the night with a bunch of dudes hanging out in parkas, what looks like parkas, and under a street lamp and ask them for directions. Hey, bro, you roll down your window. Hey, can you give me some directions? No problem. Comes reach in, unlocks the door, opens the back door, has his homies come on in. I tell you what, we weren't, uh, they didn't come in because I was telling them I was headed for a Bible fellowship. <laughs> But friends, can I tell you this? Nonetheless, it takes some common sense. No, notice this, friends. A faithful life does not mean we become ignorant. Right? A faithful life does not mean we put ourselves in unnecessary risk. I don't want us to get misconstrued. Principal convictions means it is aligned according to God's word, but it's also in application to our life experiences. We see here, if we're going to stand unashamedly for the word of God, we need principal conviction. But secondly, we need personal consecration. May we stand and say, whether at home or at school or at church, that we are unashamed of Christ. To be unashamed of the gospel is to be consecrated to a calling far greater than anything this world can ever offer. 
Let me ask you this morning, friends, what motivates you? What gets you up in the morning every day? Is it for the dopamine high you get each time you reach for that phone? Is it for the recognition of your peers, your coworkers? Is it to make a lot of money for yourself? As we grow older, we discover the necessity of having a good spiritual foundation so that we can experience true significance and lasting satisfaction. This requires us, however, to, pro- to have a proper mindset. This may require us to, be, to recalibrate our, or renew our minds in God's word. Timothy tells, oh, Paul tells us in the book of Timothy, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Oh, friends, we must beware the lies being taught in our public education system. That of evolution, the denial of God's existence. Humanism, the exaltation of mankind, and the rejection of God in regards to our morality and our values. Postmodernism, a denial of God in the Bible and religious circles, stating that you don't need God in order to worship. Something that you can have significance and satisfaction without God. Oh, we must beware the half-truths and perversions being spouted off by mainstream media and social media platforms. Telling us here, and I taught to tell our teenagers, hey, you know what? Your value does not come in the color of your skin. It's by the content of your character. That every individual here is an image bearer of God. Where they're born are still in the womb, dear friends. That being oppressed is not a license to commit atrocities to your neighbors. That all civil authorities, like the police, they are not evil and murderous. To let them know that there are consequences to what you say, watch, and approve online. This removes that there is to be a personal responsibility for our words and actions, maybe not by others, but because of an omniscient and omnipresent God. That if you don't agree with mainstream ideology, then you are to be silenced and canceled is an idea that is not appropriate or nor condoned here. That we are to hold to and practice biblical values and principles despite being called bigots and haters by those of our peers. Telling them that those who believe in the sanctity of life before birth, though it might be against women's rights, do, is still according to God's word and glorifies him. And that everybody who says otherwise, have you noticed? They're already born. Friends, we must not give in to these lies. We must know who's behind it all. And the answer is the devil The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Why? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Dear friends, to stand unashamedly for for Christ and the gospel requires us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We should not allow ourselves to be imprisoned to the thoughts and ideas of the world's culture. As Christians and followers of Christ, we are new creatures. Paul put it this way to the church of Colossae, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Why is it so important, Pastor Eddie, to be consecrated? Well, first of all, friends, because we're commanded to do so. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18, it tells here, be, not ye, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what conquer hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what art agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Well, friends, he commanded, but because also he's holy. Peter tells in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So what does it mean to be consecrated? Well, simply put, friends, it's to be more like Christ, not more of the culture. Romans chapter 8, we all like to quote verse 28 for all. And all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. But notice here, friends, verse 29 really culminates it for us. It tells us, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Get this now. The moment you and I got saved, we got saved for a purpose. And the purpose is to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
Friends, if you are going to make an impact in, in your workplace, in your homes, your communities, your neighbors, it's going to take Christian, young, uh, Christian people to stand unashamedly for Christ. We see you can stand unashamedly. It takes principal convictions, personal consecration. And finally, friends, it's going to require us to have a proper continuation. Notice in verse 17 of our text in Romans 1, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Oh, friends, we are so blessed to live in the United States of America, aren't we? So many men and women have given their lives for the freedoms that we, are, we take for granted today. Praise the Lord for the faith of our founding fathers that predicated our Constitution and the Bill of Rights upon the Word of God. Praise the Lord for the faithful martyrs who gave their lives so that we can have the King James Version Bible for all English-speaking people today. We can recount the many lives of, of those who have died for their faith and maybe even picture that as, um, as the very definition of what it means to stand unashamedly for the gospel. Dear friends, I can tell you right now that choosing to live each day for Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and denying the flesh is going to be one of the hardest decisions that you will have to make every single day. It'll be, it will be tested during times of temptations. It will be tested during times of adversity. To continue is a tough but rewarding decision and one that will make the biggest impact for eternity. Paul told Timothy to continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Fellow teachers, can I tell you this? Your Sunday school teaching, whether you're working with preschoolers, children's ministry, teens, or adults, yours is an essential job. Your ministry is important. Our people need to see examples of people who will stun, stand unashamedly demonstrating their faith each year. You know, praise God, we've had great events on our church calendar throughout this year. And our pastor, pastor, pastor has diligently chosen men of God to preach the word of God to us. We've had revival services, missions conference, couples conferences, outreach ministries, extension ministries, club ministries, adult growth groups, prayer works ministry, prayer groups. Our online resources like live stream and our sermon archive are great. But friends, at, at the end of the day, you know what it's going to take? You and I to go forth and to tell people, to tell our loved ones, to hand that track out, to have somebody register, maybe even bring them here. Be in prayer for us, that pastor being mentioned here. I'm in charge of our, our, our transportation ministry, friends. And I'm grateful. Our Washington Manor Route has been going on for uh, nearly a couple months now. We've been picking up a few of our uh, children here in the Washington Manor area. But you know what I love to do, friends? To be able to see more people. It's unfortunate a lot of our, our, our old writers here, our former writers, whose parents have, don't come to church, don't find it safe for them to be in the same, in the, in the same um, route as some of these people here. It's calling on some of my, my old bus writers. They don't see the importance of being in the house of God. Well, friends, if we're going to stand unashamedly for Christ, if we're going to finish, finish this year strong, we must remember that it starts with principled convictions. When people go through hard times, they're not going to be looking for the class clown. They're not going to be looking for that popular person. No, friends, as I learned through experience, they're going to be looking for you and I, people who have principled convictions, people whose lives are lives of personal consecration, People whose lives are demonstrated by a proper continuation. I may not be much, but I, as Pastor Dean Heron stated, and our pastor said as well, you may not have a lot of ability, but what you can be is faithful. Friends, you're going to stand unashamedly. We must be grounded upon the Word of God through our convictions. We've got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit through personal consecration. And we're going to continue in accordance to God's word.